Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie for Reason TV. Today we're talking to T. Marcus Funk, author of Victims' Rights and Advocacy at the International Criminal Court. Marcus, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, why did you write the book? You know, I, I wrote the book, I spent some time in Kosovo, I spent two years uh, for the State Department on Kosovo between, I'm a Department of Justice employee, so I did two years in Kosovo and had an opportunity to see firsthand the work of uh, international judges, international prosecutors, uh, both in Kosovo within, within the Balkan region as well, Serbia, uh, Bosnia, and so I, I developed a really uh, strong interest in the topic of, of uh, international criminal courts and also international prosecutions. We're talking about The Hague, mm -hmm. we're talking about the prosecution of uh, criminals against humanity. What is The Hague's record on successful prosecutions? Well, The Hague, there, there are a number of different um, uh, courts in The Hague, but in, in terms of the International Criminal Court, uh, the record, uh, which is situated in, in The Hague, of course, uh, the record is that in the last seven years they have indicted um, uh, they have two cases and one uh, ongoing trial, uh, the Diello trial, uh, which is ongoing right now. Um, so, so far no convictions, uh, but obviously we're optimistic that that'll change. In terms of similar courts, if you look at the ad hoc tribunal uh, for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY tribunal, um, uh, they had, uh, over the course of approximately 16 years, uh, they were able to get 61 uh, final uh, con convictions, um, which is in itself a, a decent number. The, the, the sentences were, were perhaps to American ears a little surprising in the sense that we have of the 61 some people, uh, over 20 got sentences of less than 10 years and only 10 got sentences of more than 20 years. So when you compare the sentences for, for these individuals, which at least uh, uh, in terms of the principles of the court are, are some of the greatest committed some of the most grievous crimes uh, imaginable, um, they, uh, they, they seem to be pr pretty low to a lot of American observers. Why, why is that? Why, uh, why, do, why do the sentences come in? You know, if you, you can kill dozens of people, hundreds of people, thousands of people, and, and walk out after 20 years. I, I think it fundamentally break, boils down to a, a different way of viewing what, what, the, what the sentencing structure is. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the judges uh, from the, of the court um, have a different view of, of the purposes of the court. Uh, I, I, and, and of course, many people are going to have different views about why this is, but we, we observe in, in criminal trials uh, in Europe and also, um, for that matter, in international trials that the sentences tend to be uh, lower than what, what many American observers might imagine. Now, that may be because maybe we're uh, imposing too tough a sentence on some of our federal cases. Uh, maybe they're not imposing strong enough sentences, and that's, that's one of those topics that people can debate for, for days. What uh, you, you uh, mention in the book, uh, or, or you talk about the numbers and the weakness of numbers when we're talking about things like crimes against humanity, genocide, other types of uh, you know, horrible acts, why are the numbers so bad? Well, I mean, you, you can look at the example of, of the Congo uh, conflict uh, where you have from around 1998 to 2003, uh, 2004, you have some three million uh, individuals who have been killed who died as a result of the conflict. I mean, those are enormous numbers. They're really impossible to, to grasp, to be honest with you. Um, and, and so uh, it is an incredible task to try to address uh, those sorts of crimes. I mean, it, it's, it's extraordinarily complex. Uh, the cases are complex. Uh, the defendants are hard to get physically in terms of getting jurisdiction over them. Um, uh, it's, it's a great challenge to prosecute, I think, those kinds of cases. And so whenever you have numbers like that in terms of millions of people who've been killed in, in genocides or in war, war crimes, crimes against humanity, what collectively referred to as atrocity crimes, um, you're really ne only going to get the people with command responsibility, and, and arguably that's what the purpose of, of these tribunals is, is to pick off the people who are really in charge and not the mid or lower level um, criminals. I mean, one could argue that, that in an ideal world we would, we would be able to convict all of them, but the realities are, are not that way. Are these the types of crimes that should be adjudicated you know, by the international community, or does it always come down to uh, you know, that um, you know, these, these would be better prosecuted in, in different forums altogether? Well, th the question has both a practical um, dimension and also a sort of philosophical dimension. On, on the practical dimension, and I'm speaking just you know, as an as a observer of these things, not uh, on, in my official capacity, obviously, 
I'm happy to see criminals prosecuted uh, by whomever, wherever um, they can be prosecuted. In other words, if, if, if you have provided people due process, you've, you've, got, you've investigated a case properly, you've given people a fair trial, um, whether that's done uh, at, at The Hague or whether that's done in Darfur, um, uh, matters less, I think, than that it gets done. Um, now that's the practical view, and maybe this is me speaking as a prosecutor, overemphasizing the practical view. The, the sort of the more the political view, of course, is that there is the international will, and and for a lot of people that is an important uh, symbolic significance that the international community comes together and decides that this person is uh, uh, deserving of of the of being. Uh, arrested and prosecuted in an international forum and being subjected to the condemnation of the international community. Um, people can differ as to whether that is or should be um, a motivator um, as opposed to the practical. Uh, uh, but from my perspective, uh, I, I, if a domestic jurisdiction can prosecute cases well and fairly, by all means, I'm, I'm all for it. Isn't that uh, the case that I uh, say in the former Yugoslavia, and Lord hopes not the future Yugoslavia, uh, would it be better to have the, you know, the criminals tried there by people uh, to the degree that they can be impartial, to the degree that they can understand the, the stakes on every possible level? It just seems like a better fit, isn't it, than removing people to a, uh, to a distant jurisdiction and you talk about the international community, but uh, I mean, who speaks for the international community? Is it the people from Darfur? Is it the people from Yugoslavia? Well, in, in many ways, I mean, the international criminal court is sort of a reverse federalism paradigm. I mean, uh, many people view the international criminal court as being the, the court that's on top of all other courts. In reality, uh, perhaps a better way of looking at it is that it's a catch-all court. It catches those cases that cannot be prosecuted and, 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 and um, uh, investigated properly in the domestic jurisdiction. At least that is what the purpose of the International Criminal Court is. And so is it better to prosecute a case locally or domestically? On the basis of the International Criminal Court, the Rome Statute's own articles and rules, it is. Uh, the, the, the default position is the case gets prosecuted in the home jurisdiction, or the domestic jurisdiction. If the jurisdiction is either unable or unwilling to prosecute the case, then it comes to the International Criminal Court. When I say the case, we're talking about cases that qualify as atrocity crimes. And so the, the International Criminal Court's statutory framework builds in the assumption that it's preferable to have it done domestically. What is the United States' position to the ICC, and what should it be? Well, that's, that's one I'm, 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 not, I'm going to have to punt on, or rather I'm going to have to... Um, uh, I'm not going to be able to answer just because in terms of what the U.S. position is right now, I can tell you what, what the, yeah. the, the, the formal position is that, that the, um, the United States obviously is an observer, um, has been active in, in helping draft the, the articles and rules by which the ICC is governed, um, has made public statements as to prosecutions, um, as to what the future role should be, that is something that will be decided. But we are not an active uh, member. We're not, an, we're not a member. We're not what's called a member of the Assembly of State Parties. We're not a state party to the ICC. Let uh, me ask, uh, or could you tell us very quickly, what, uh, what is your professional uh, background that, that you ended up, you were at sure. the State Department, but how did you get there? Uh, I started as a law professor at Oxford uh, in England and then um, clerked and, and, and went and joined the Department of Justice as a prosecutor, federal prosecutor in Chicago. Um, I stayed there until about 2004, late 2004, when I had an opportunity um, and was permitted by my boss in Chicago to, to go to the State Department, to go to Kosovo. And, uh, and Kosovo I was what's called the resident legal advisor, essentially providing guidance, uh, assistance, uh, research and so forth to the both the chief of missions now the ambassador now the Kosovo is formally considered a country um, and then also to local legal actors and so that, I did that until 2006 and then I came back to Chicago where I'm now in the organized crime um, business section well I'm not in the business as much as uh, <laughs> just trying well, to put people in business. Well that's why we hear about Chicago. Yeah, all I hear, time, I hear. I've, 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 I've seen it on TV yeah. here and there yeah. Thank you, Marcus. We've been talking to T. Marcus Funk, author of Victims' Rights and Advocacy at the International Criminal Court. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.